<laughs> well, my name is Kent Hare. I'm the Minister of Veterans Affairs, and this is my uh, Acting Deputy Minister, Karen Ellis. I'm so glad you could join us here on Facebook Live. Yeah. We've had an amazing uh, two-day summit here, hearing from uh, 150 d different veterans and veterans organizations, adding their contributions to views on our policies, our mental health strategy, our commemoration and everything in between. And we think this is a, a wonderful time to uh, be able to connect to broader Canadians, to hear from veterans and others interested in the field, to uh, ask your questions to us and put us on the hot seat to see uh, what uh, developed out of this session as well as to what we're thinking about and what we're trying to improve in the lives of our, our veterans and their families. So thank you very much for uh, joining us and I'm looking forward to this a great, great deal. Okay, thank you, Minister. So maybe we'll start with a question from Facebook. Are you ready for the first question? Yes. This government campaigned on a promise to reinstate medical pension for injured veterans. Is this actually going to happen? And if so, when will these pensions be implemented? Well, that's a great question. One of the most exciting days in my life was when I received my mandate letter from Prime Minister Trudeau on November 4th. Included in that, mandate letter was to create an option for a lifetime pension for our medically injured veterans. And I can say we remain committed to each and every item in that mandate letter, including an option for a pension. We're working uh, around the clock to try and uh, look at what's best for veterans, but yet uh, we know we, we want to just not do this rushed. We want to get this right because for us to go to a system of delivering financial security for our veterans is the heart of what we want to do, because without financial security, it's very difficult to have uh, uh, mental health, physical health, all of those things that we want our veterans to have. So I can say proudly we are committed to this and the other pledges in my mandate letter from the Prime Minister. Thank you. Do we have a question for the audience here? If not, we have a question from Twitter. Minister, when will you keep your promise to restore pension for veterans and settle the Equitas lawsuit? Well, those are two, que two questions there. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the first one first. We uh, learned here that uh, over the course of the summit that there's a, a process to implementing uh, promises and pledges that we made in our platform. It runs through a government cycle of putting in our information through to uh, the cabinet and then to deliver on that in our budget outcomes. And in our first uh, budget in 2016, we delivered $5.6 billion in financial services to veterans and their families. We were very proud of that. The increase to the disability award, the increase to the permanent impairment allowance, and other changes that will better veterans and their families' lives. This stakeholder group had very many comments around uh, differences between what was in the Pension Act and what is in the new Veterans Charter. They gave us great ideas on how they want to marry the best of both of these uh, programs to ensure we have uh, both a wellness model to allow uh, our veterans to have employment and education opportunities and rehab opportunities to get them better, as well as that financial security. So the work is well underway. In regards to the Equitas lawsuit, I can say uh, we are addressing uh, many of those issues through the implementation of good public policy. Much of what we based our election platform on and what the policies were implemented are taking from various veterans and stakeholders groups who had issues with the former government and the last relatively little progress that has happened over the last 10 years in regards to the new Veterans Charter. Where we brought it in, it was supposed to be a living document that was going to be continued to add on, to be continued to work on, to be continued to uh, help build veterans and their families' lives. We didn't see that over the last 10 years. And I think we showed good on our commitment to veterans in the last 
budget. I know the stakeholders here are holding to me account on implementing the rest of uh, our mandate letter <coughs> items, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Continue to work on financial security and better outcomes for veterans and their families, full stop. General of Canada. So the question is this, you had four options with the Equitas lawsuit. One was do nothing and let it continue. The second one was to draft a new abeyance agreement. The third one was to uh, extend the abeyance agreement. And the fourth one was to undertake settlement negotiations pursuant to Section 9 of the British Columbia Rules of Supreme Court. Why did you choose to let the first option go ahead and let the lawsuit continue? Who's actually advising the lawyers in the Department of Justice? You or Jody Wilson-Raybould on this particular file? Well, first off, I'm a recovering lawyer and a struggling politician working as hard as I can to better their lives of veterans and their families. We believe that we're uh, running government by good public policy. To be honest, sir, I can't run government by individual lawsuit, okay? There are right now uh, 45,000 lawsuits against the government of Canada. And I want to ensure that my department is focused on bettering the outcomes of veterans and their families' lives, full stop. That's what we're working towards and we believe we're gonna address many of the concerns expressed in many areas and forums across this country through the implementation of good public policy I uh, know that uh, many in the veterans community were excited with our platform pledges that we ran on the last election and what we're delivering. And we're delivering so far on that mandate, mandate letter and we'll continue to do so. Maybe we can go, go to a oh, uh, question on Facebook and then uh, you after, is that okay? Is anything going to be done to close the gap between uh, veterans regard on CISIP uh, long-term disability and veterans on uh, earnings loss benefit? This is a great question. And it stems out our recent changes to the earning loss benefit and continuing to note that there are challenges and cleavages within the system itself. We have a... Uh, patchwork of programs and policies that have developed over the last 50, 60, 70 years. And every government that has come along has tried to fix these problems with scotch tape, duct tape, or whatever they had in their back pocket. We right now, with the work I'm doing with Minister Sajan, on closing the scene, trying to get better outcomes for people transitioning from Department of National Defense to Veterans Affairs is at the heart of the mandate, as well as looking at the discrepancies in payment scales and the like that have developed over the last um, umpteen years in the making to uh, develop a more holistic approach to uh, veteran-centric communities, veteran-centric financial security that will work for them and their families. That work has really uh, taken profound steps over the course of the summer. And uh, if anyone, had, if you were here, uh, we had Chief of Defense Staff uh, John Vance here uh, for our noon hour presentation, who explained the difficulties in these systems and the, the complex array of services provided by Veterans Affairs Canada, Department of National Defense. We're trying to simplify, clarify, and make them more effective for veterans and their families. Thank you. I think we have a question from the audience. Thank you, Minister, for taking questions. I was fortunate enough to participate in the summit, and I really uh, enjoyed the fact that we focused on some very important and challenging topics like mental health. We talked about families, care and support, and uh, we talked a lot of, about these issues in a blue sky thinking manner. There was a lot of uh, I want, there's a lot of I need. Um, we know the reality of the situation is that we may not get all the things that we need. I'm wondering on behalf of the summit members, but also those listening uh, and um, uh, the general public and other veterans and their families, how will they then see the records of decisions going forward 
about some of these uh, new services, programs, that type of thing, to see that the work that we're doing is in fact creating decisions and programs and services. Does that, does that make sense as a question? Yes, I, we, and you, you're perfectly correct. We had uh, six advisory groups present uh, issues for us to consider for implementing our mandate commitments as well as beyond that, as looking at the future, what can be best for veterans and their families. And you point out a, a real good point. Uh, good public policy is often balanced with the ability of the government to deliver in terms of adding uh, capacity to the system through actual budget dollars. That's the reality of the system that we, that we live in. It's uh, that we have to balance good public policy with the ability of uh, the coffers of the government of Canada. And I think rectifying some of these issues, which uh, I, I have learned of over the last 10 months and many more that were brought up here, will filter into us to be able to prioritize prioritize and focus on what can be delivered this upcoming cycle, as well as what we continue to work towards building in the future. We, we can't look at these as, as just a, a one and done scenario. Like you didn't deliver on your commitments full mandate item list in budget 2016, what's the matter with you? Although that is the sentiment of, of some, we have, a long way to go, and we know we're, we're going to get there. It may take time, it may take patience, but yeah, we're working towards better outcomes, full stop. Maybe we can take uh, another question uh, from Facebook, and then we'll come back if question in the audience. And this is a question in French, and it's regarding the uh, um, backlog of uh, files at uh, Veteran Affairs. Le ministre peut-il commenter sur l'arriérée de dossiers à Anciens combattants Canada? Plus de 11 000 dossiers en retard. J'ai soumis ma dernière demande en janvier 2016 et je n'ai pas encore reçu de réponse. Merci pour votre question. But since that's about the extent of my French, although I am taking lessons, I am going to have Karen answer it and then I will uh, add my uh, flair in, uh, in, in my language. We, I'm going to need some more time on my practique français. Uh, très bien, ministre. Um, uh, maintenant, nous avons uh, plus que 11 000 uh, dossiers en cours. Ça veut dire qu'ils sont en train d'être réglés. Et dans ce nombre, dans ce chiffre, on a 3 500 qui maintenant prend plus que 16 semaines uh, pour, uh, pour résoudre. Et la raison pour laquelle c'est la situation, c'est que ces, do ces dossiers sont les plus complexes et ça prend plus de temps et plus de, de recherches et plus de consultations à vraiment régler et à terminer les dossiers. C'est notre réalité. Quand à des cas plus complexes, ça prend plus de temps. And I, and I thank you for that question. And just to, just to clarify, there are the 11,000 number that are in, those are the current applications that are before Veterans Affairs of Canada. And I will say that the vast majority of them, 8,000 of them, are with our timelines and guidelines for when we would like a decision to, to be made. There are 3,500 that are outside the recommended timelines which we try to keep to. Of that 3,500, many of them are complex cases which need uh, analysis and detail and, uh, of course, uh, some officiousness to complete. That's the reality. But I also point out that since in the last year, since we've been the government of the day, we have increased by 27% the amount of disability claims that have come in and gotten out, of the, out the door. We're very proud of this increased surface. The next thing is that 22% more claims are coming into the department. And that's because they know our government is working hard, getting out there, meeting with veterans and say, please apply, come get the benefits that you're entitled to. And I think some of that work has come from the result of us being from coast to coast to coast this summer, opening offices, okay? 
That's one of the things that has created a lot of excitement around our government. Also, the fact that we've hired 250 new frontline staff. The former government cut up to one third of my frontline staff. That made it very difficult for them, one, to do outreach, and two, to deliver on the services veterans and their families need. So I actually look at this as a bit of a good news story, if you can believe that. We're moving in the right direction. Thank you. I think there is a question for the audience. All right. We uh, clearly hear yesterday uh, General Van's commitment to address uh, sexual misconduct in the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, we know that Veterans Affairs was not included in Commission Deschamps' scope. And uh, I was curious to know what is your plan to assess the needs of military sexual trauma survivors and how to ensure the needs that these veterans are met? And that's a, a very good question. I was very impressed with General Vance and the direction he has set uh, under uh, his mandate to end, uh, end discrimination within the Canadian Armed Forces in any form and fashion. I believe he calls it uh, uh, his honor pledge mm -hmm. that he's going forward with. And I'm very proud to be Associate Minister of National Defense and work with him on these strategies. And in my unique role, and I think it was very wise of our Prime Minister to make me both Veterans Affairs Minister and Associate Minister of National Defense so we can coordinate the work they're currently doing in the military on this, take what they, they're developing and move that into our services into Veterans Affairs Canada. So when people who are medically releasing, who still need that assistance on a physical or a mental health issue, can come in and get the help they need where and when they need it. Because our counselors should be adept and should be up to speed on uh, being able to do it. So I appreciate the question. Karen, maybe you can augment that answer with uh, more details of where we are. Well, what I would say is um, the minister mentioned yesterday, we, we know that for uh, certain cases um, for people who have really got serious uh, injuries, um, they get the uh, case manager would be assigned to them. And that is one way in which somebody could talk about an issue such as, as the sexual trauma that you've mentioned and, and would be able to get access to uh, a, whole, a whole plan of, of the kinds of treatments and support they might need. The minister mentioned yesterday that we're doing a pilot um, uh, that's actually started in three cities. We want to test something called guided support because we know there's kind of a, a gap for people who might not need yet or don't know if they need the full case management, but are very, uh, maybe they're stressed, maybe they just don't know where to start in terms of finding the help they need in the department. And so we're, we're testing out with a, sort of a trial group of veterans in three parts of Canada for six months to say, how can we do a much more hands-on, uh, personalized approach to help people that need more than a MyVac account or you know an electronic solution, who actually need to talk to somebody to help them find their way to the right services without having to do all the heavy lifting themselves. So we're trying that out for six months, and at the end of the fiscal year, we'll iron out you know whatever didn't work and, and work on what does work, and then we'll obviously want to expand that across the department and make that something that makes it easier for people to get the help they need sooner. So I know that's one important piece we, we know we need to work on, and we are. I would also be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to uh, show that our department is uh, committed to having case managers work within a reasonable mm -hmm. realm uh, so people can get actually help when they need it from a case manager. When I came into the department, many of our case managers had sometimes 35, 45 people they were directly working with, and they had no ability to keep up or give that individualized attention that is needed in many cases. Now, uh, under uh, the change in government and the hiring back of uh, people who uh, serve and continue to be able to have backgrounds to deliver the services on case management, we're moving to a standard of an average of 25 to one. We believe this will have real impacts on people's lives that will allow them to get the individualized care that them and their families need.
And, and the last thing I would just offer is Charlotte is here. She's our acting deputy minister for service delivery. But I mentioned in a, an earlier part of the summit that if there is a really urgent case or someone is really in a crisis and, and things are not moving quickly enough uh, and they need help right away, we do have a system where their file will be raised to our attention, you know, including to mine and, and the deputies and the minister's office. And, and we will address that, you know, sort of that day we reach out and, and try to help that person. So in those cases, when somebody is in really uh, dire need, we will, we will make that a, a top priority for the day. Thank you. Maybe we can uh, take another question from uh, Facebook. Hi, Minister. I was wondering if you could better explain the education that was mentioned during the election. Can you please let me know what will the new benefit uh, entail and who will be entitled to it? Thank you. Well, in my mandate letter was a commitment to provide education opportunities to veterans and to allow them the uh, ability to get retraining educated, whether that be through a, uh, a certificate program, whether it be from a two-year college program to a uh, full university program. And I can say right now that we're working on options for that to happen. Part of that work is with Minister Sajan, because right now the uh, Department of National Defense has a fair, when you're serving, has a fairly comprehensive program in that regard. We have some programs that assist in this after the fact, but it's not as robust as we'd like. And we're working on options to really get uh, veterans and their families the ability to go back to school. So other than I can tell you that we're working on it, the, the details have uh, not uh, emerged on a final solution, but uh, we remain committed to this and the other issue, uh, other items on my mandate agenda, which, agenda, which uh, it's kind enough that people here at the uh, six advisory uh, committees uh, reminded me of a time or two these last two days. So it refocused my attention always on that mandate letter, what we committed to Canadians and our veterans, and uh, we're working hard to get it done. Thank you. We have a question for the audience. bought out all these figures on how much money was cost from DAC to help out our veterans, but no figures were ever bought out about how much money was saved by the pharmaceuticals that these veterans weren't done, weren't using. Plus, in the other thing is that you uh, you stated that you were looking at changing the rules on the DAC. Now, this makes me think not one word was ever mentioned about what was bought for from the other uh, stakeholders when you were here for planning that. Well, I appreciate the question. And uh, when I came into Veterans Affairs Canada, I was shocked to find there was no policy surrounding the use of marijuana for medical purposes. And as we all know, this is an emerging field with various viewpoints on it. And we have taken the time now to meet with stakeholders, meet with the medical community, consult on a bride, wide array of people uh, who are uh, working in this field to format what we're going to be delivering soon as an actual policy around this with the health and wellness of veterans at the core of our mandate. And we're continuing that work. I appreciate the question because, uh, you know, it, it's an important issue and how we deal with this in a holistic fashion that ensures uh, veterans are doing the best they can is uh, at the heart of our mandate. I, I frankly would have, uh, would have liked this to be done earlier, but I think rushing it does not serve anyone's purpose. And I think uh, our department's doing a great job of uh, making sure we get all the information and not rushing into a decision. No, nothing's been changed and everybody's still working through the same policy as the one before to take us off. We're working on a policy that will come out in due time. Thank you. Maybe we can go to a question uh, to Facebook. And the next question is uh, in French, 
And it's a question regarding the change to the disability award uh, to occur in April 2007. Est-ce que les vétérans qui ont déjà reçu une indemnité d'invalidité recevront un paiement rétroactif en avril? Lorsque le montant maximal atteindra 360, 360 000 et si oui, jusqu'à quelle date? Oui, la réponse est oui. Et l'augmentation sera payée à, à partir du 1er avril 2006, euh, la date de la nouvelle charte. So, my understanding is that we are implementing our disability award April 1st of 2017. We are, and we, the payments will start going back to April 1st, from April 1st, 2006, the date of the new Veterans Charter. And that, that's what we thought when we implemented this, yeah. that was fair, that we recognized that moving our disability award from $310,000 to $360,000, which was a recommendation of the Veterans Ombudsman, was the right thing to do. And to have left out people who came earlier despite that recommendation going forward a long time ago, I can say it was brought up in uh, the committee level uh, under the former government. No action was taken, I'm proud of the fact that our government has moved on that recommendation. It's going to be more money in uh, veterans' pockets uh, to be able to build their lives. We're very proud of that commitment. Okay. Any uh, question from the audience? Uh, Mr. I have uh, one question with regards to that lump sum increase on April 1st. I work for a well-being network. A lot of the guys are asking, how long until that policy implementation actually meets the bank account? Like to give a forecast of there's 54,000 plus claims. Do, do, do you guys have an idea of how long it will take? Well, I, I know we're long. starting at April 1st, but uh, I will let Karen. Uh, uh, give, part of my question, answers. sir, is with all these new managers that you're hiring, are we going to go into a backlog of the, the pop up or the, the ongoing claims? What I would I would just kick it off by saying that um, whenever we do have uh, a surge of new kinds of uh, benefits and things coming in, we develop a plan to be able to bring in maybe some extra help at the time. There will always, of course, uh, we have to adjust depending on volume and how and what time frame they come into. But I'm going to ask Charlotte to speak to that because she actually is in the business of, you know, directing all of those implementation pieces. Uh, we're uh, uh, working out the implementation plan, but it's to make it as smooth as possible for veterans, not having to fill out an application. People that have received the, uh, the awards, we know who they are, and they'll be able contacted so we can uh, proceed with the uh, payment as soon as possible on April 1st. Uh, question is, what's the plan for that implementation? Is it alphabetical? Is it by 2006, 2007? How do you plan to start doling that money back out to the veterans? Uh, it wouldn't be, uh, it would be all at once for all the veterans. Mm -hmm. We have calculators and systems that get prepped up to let the payment move quickly. Do okay. Can you uh, yes, sir. My uh, my question is uh, with to the uh, lump sum payment award. There is a little bit of confusion on it. I've, I have seen some communications come out on the uh, Veterans Affairs Canada website on what it would mean, and the explanation to me is not quite clear. Um, and I, Dennis LeBlanc, I'm here at the summit, and I'm honored to be here and I still don't have clarification. So my question would be, in April 1st, 2006, the charter came into effect. So say April 2nd, 2006, Corporal Bloggins gets blown up. 2016, or sorry, 2017, April 1st, is Corporal Bloggins, he initially got paid out 250,000, just a, an estimate. So is that Corporal Bloggins going to get the complete top up to $360,000? Or is there going to be some formula to cut it down so he actually will not get the full payout? Well, well we, uh, we, we did the disability award, recognizing it moved from $310,000 to $350,000. What people received their former disability award will be based upon a 
percentage formula of what increase they would have received should have the disability award been $360,000 at the time of their award being given. We sense this is fair and we sense going back to uh, the time the new Veterans Charter was implemented is the right thing to do. We also want to ensure people are going to get uh, financial counseling, the ability to uh, uh, make decisions for them and their family. They're going to benefit their lives. And we are also, uh, you know, coupling this with uh, what we're doing on the uh, financial security side of things and what we've already done. And maybe I could add, you know, the, the 360000 uh, for the disability award is the new maximum. So it, you know, the calculation for somebody's disability award uh, is based on what kind of injuries and extent of injury they have. And so whatever would have uh, been what they were awarded, you know, will be obviously um, adjusted accordingly. However, my question is, he was paid at 100% 250000 on 2006. In 2017, for 2017, is that member who was paid out at 100% at 2006 going to receive the new maximum of 360000 Well, and my understanding is yes, but just to make sure, please contact the department so your friend does not get misinformation so we fully know the file fully understand the exact parameters and that this doesn't turn into a game of telephone tag okay where mm -hmm. i heard Agreed. this i heard this we want to be right and someone from the department should be able to run through what the award was at the time under the new circumstances what, what it is going to be does that sound fair yes that's fair thank you perfect Okay, we can, um, one more question from Facebook. Yeah, let's okay. do one more. Okay. Parks Canada is not part of the priority hire for veterans. Can that be changed? Well, I, I appreciate this question. And uh, my understanding is that since 2014, we uh, have a priority hiring act that wants to see more veterans who wish to work in the public service come and join our team. We remain committed to this as a government, and we understand that we have to do better on ensuring veterans transition and have opportunities to work in the public service. And I'll full well admit, right now, we are not doing as good a job we should in that regard. We see our veterans' numbers not where I would like them to be. So part of our work this summer has been working toward what is effective uh, programs to allow for veterans to get jobs, whether that be in the public service or in the private sector or starting new, their own businesses. So we sense we're getting a pretty good handle of what can actually move uh, people's lives forward, experimenting with a whole host of options that we're gonna present. And yet on the, the specific questions on uh, Parks Canada, I would, uh, I'll continue to uh, think about that and look at where we go, but maybe Karen, you do know the um, specific reference to Parks I, Canada and the reason and the rationale mm -hmm. at this time? I could certainly comment. Uh, Parks Canada is uh, one of a number of agencies that are part of the Government of Canada. So they sometimes operate under some different types of uh, rules and legislation. But that said, we've already started to work with Parks Canada and other agencies. Uh, to try and build a similar approach for them to be open to uh, hiring our veterans. So definitely that's uh, in the works. I well, think there's a lot of openness to this. Well, just in close, I want to thank each and every one of you who have taken part by Facebook as well as the, uh, this is the third summit I've had since being Minister of Veterans Affairs. I've had the opportunity to learn a lot, to grow a lot, to understand the, the needs and the issues that are out there and understand that I will continue to work as hard as I can to make veterans and their families' lives better. And I just hope everyone understands that it, it's, it's a work in progress. We will get there and we're all in it together and we'll continue to build not only a better veterans community, but a better Canada together.
Take care. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, coming on board today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Ke the Deputy. I, and I'd like to uh, just mention that we didn't get to all the questions that we were getting from Twitter and Facebook, so we'll be following with responses to those questions. So I'd like to thank everybody's participation on Facebook Live and in this audience, and thank you, and have a good afternoon.